Well, good morning. My name is Ralph Mitchell. I'm the County Extension Director and Horticulture Agent. And uh, welcome to our Landscape Gardening Series. And the topic I'm going to cover today is called Common Sense Gardening, Myths and Reality. Um, I, I sort of put this together because I found a lot of things that people were saying <laughs> were not necessarily uh, going with some of the, uh, uh, the facts on that. And some of it, of course, um, uh, I don't want to say it's urban legend, but uh, some of it can be that way. So, you know, when we're looking at discerning this too, um, we, oops, we want to um, differentiate uh, how things occur uh, as far as, uh, I don't want to say folk tales or just old information that um, gets circulated through the uh, society and through other uh, medias um, that uh, stick. And so just hoping to unstick some of this. And unfortunately, University of Florida, uh, IFAS Extension Service helps to provide research-based unbiased information. So let's go through some of this here and we'll, we'll try to untangle some of this. Um, and, you know, we're always learning new things. I guess that's the other one too. So. Um, as we find new information, we try to get that back out into the community. Here's one here, pruning trees. Uh, there's a myth that tree wounds from uh, pruning should be coated with an asphalt-based paint for protection. And you can see there, it's a, well, it's an old wound. And it looks like it's been filled in with some kind of a tarry type material. Um, and they did studies in the 70s, and they found that actually putting some kind of pruning seal on a wound will actually uh, lock in organisms and make things worse. And once you've got that seal on there, the decay is going to occur behind it, and then it will begin to work in. Uh, a proper pruning cut will actually uh, make a perfect um, seal, and, and trees never heal. They seal, they lay down layers of wood, to, to block the outside. So um, in the studies they did, um, I think the one was orange shellac. They said that seemed to be the least harmful. But, and I've also heard people say, well, if you want to put a layer on um, uh, because it makes you feel better, <laughs> you probably could. But we're going to say you do a proper pruning cut. You do not need to be putting any type of asphalt-based paint on that uh, as a uh, wound seal and just let it be. All right, and speaking of pruning, and again, going back to the 70s when there was a lot of studies about um, what was going on inside a tree as far as how does it seal up wounds. And it used to be, as you can see on the right hand there, wrong, <laughs> um, where they would do what they called the flush cut. And the flush cut would simply take the branch off pretty much right up against the trunk. Um, again, some studies were done by scientists and found if you'll see what they on the left hand side, what they call the branch collar and the branch bark ridge. The branch collar is sort of a swollen area. It doesn't look the same on every single species of tree, but generally it's going to be very evident. And uh, if you maintain that branch collar, the tree actually has um, a sealing uh, ability to fill that wound in with wood. And eventually that whole spot will, will, will be covered and be absorbed. You won't even see it after a while. So what do you do? Um, not that in nature, there's a dotted line right outside the branch collar, but once you've identified the branch collar, you'd make the cut just, just outside that branch collar at an angle and then remove it. Um, uh, again, not all branch collars are going to be like that picture and be very swollen, uh, but they'll have some kind of a indicator of a branch collar. And then the branch bark ridge is just above it. And that's another cue um, as to where to make that cut. All right, used to be a lot of information that planting time pruned back the top part of the tree. And the idea was, well, you know, you're planting a tree that's lost maybe 90% of its roots. We should balance it out by removing a lot of the top portion of the tree too. But they found that that's not really a good idea, although the roots may be 
minimal. Um, the top part is the part that's going to help support the plant and begin to grow back those roots and new shoots. Now you can certainly uh, uh, prune out any broken or dead or diseased bits and pieces, but don't compensate uh, the top for the bottom because it doesn't um, doesn't work, and you need that top to support the tree and uh, uh, getting it established. All right. <clears throat> The myth was securely stake all trees at planting time. Well, uh, you know, the, the short answer is yes and no, I guess here, where it's certainly necessary for some trees to be staked. Um, some though that are smaller may not be necessarily uh, be necessary to do it. And um, so you'll have to see smaller, um, more sturdy trees likely do not. Bigger ones, if you're going to do it, there are a number of different types of staking kits or ways of doing this. Um, it's pretty much to make sure the tree um, does not get blown over and that it has some play in it. So it can, I want to say rock back and forth a little bit, but so it's a little bit influenced by the wind. And um, another thing too, if you do stake it, you want to make sure after a season to remove the staking materials. Some people leave it to rot. Sometimes those staking materials though do not decay or break down, whether they're wire or plastic. And then you have a girdling problem where you're actually going to um, damage the tree by not removing uh, the staking material. So good for a season and um, uh, stake if necessary. Um, but again, some of the smaller trees may not really necessarily need it. Bottom line, if you use it, make sure to remove it after a season. All right, myth, drought tolerant plants don't need watering. Well, that's true and false, I guess. Um, in that all plants are gonna need water for establishment. You can't just put plants out and ho hope for the best. Even in the rainy season, you may not be able to have that uh, uh, consistent moisture that's needed. And it's, it's very interesting that um, they did some studies and uh, this is what they found for a tree that has a, a caliper uh, or a diameter measurement um, less than two inches. It's good to water it every day for two weeks, every other day for two months, weekly until established. And for that size tree, say an inch-ish in size, as far as caliper diameter, uh, it may take three to four months for that to occur. And that's for it to become established enough that it's on its own roots, and then it doesn't necessarily need supplemental watering. Now that will vary from tree to tree, of course, too, or plants even. Um, a mulch will certainly help with that, not up against the trunk. And that um, if you've planted, you can plant year round, really technically, but if you plant it in the dry season, um, <clears throat> you may have to uh, give some additional watering as we get back into the rainy season. And they found it wasn't so much um, volume, but it was frequency that really made the difference. So um, I, again, uh, drought tolerant plants, once established, may be able to depend only on rainwater, depends again on our drought conditions, uh, but all plants are going to need water for establishment. All right, here's some pictures of a tree uh, trunk with cavities. And uh, the old method was to fill uh, the cavities to strengthen them with concrete or bricks and concrete or whatever. And of course, you know, years on in advance, if that tree ever had to come down and, and people could not see that uh, hardcore, certainly that would be quite a dangerous thing with a chainsaw to encounter that. They also found that um, the concrete would actually continue the wound, the inside of that uh, cavity because the tree would rock back and forth with the wind and so would the um, actual um, concrete um, chunk that was in there. So 
what what do we do? We'd say you, you got to leave that cavity open. Um, we don't want it um, to be filled with anything. Um, sometimes that can be very inviting for African ice honeybees. I've seen where people have actually carefully attached screen into that so that um, they could not get in. And, um, uh, or sometimes even a very thin layer of, of that expanding foam um, that would also cause that to, to block. But, you know, in general, the screen's probably better because it allows the cavity to air out and to dry out. Now, is a tree with the cavity um, still structurally sound? Um, we'd recommend Florida Certified Arborist to check that as far as any hazard evaluations, because even a tree that has a cylinder of, of wood left could very much um, still be to some degree stable. Um, but if you've got a tree with a cavity in it, it's probably well worth your time and money to hire a Florida certified arborist to check that out um, uh, because it could be a hazard. All right. Um, topping, here's another myth here that a lot of people like to talk about here. Uh, top trees are still uh, standing following storms, and this is a good way to manage trees. Topping is appropriate for trees in the hurricane belt. So that's the myth. It's, it's not appropriate. Uh, as you can see from that picture, it's definitely visible. Um, it's, it's inappropriate because it takes... It makes a pruning cut in a random area, which is not going to seal up properly. And all those stubs that you see will actually sprout uh, shoots and they'll cluster around that and they'll eventually potentially fill back in so that it looks like a complete tree again, sort of hidden. Um, and of course, we have a lot of evergreens that will um, sort of hide that, uh, you know, year round after it's done. But the problem is, again, all those clustered uh, shoots will begin to uh, push up against each other, get crowded. And so there's no good connection to that. The, uh, the, the uh, open part of that topped area is also going to rot back into the branch and maybe into the trunk too. So, and, you know, you, you'll see trees that will recover from it, but um, it, they believe that the, um, the, the new growth from those stubs is very weak. Um, bottom line, it's, it's not a um, proper pruning um, uh, technique. And also, um, there are ordinances against it. Uh, we do have a tree ordinance that you know, prohibits topping. Uh, I will say, though, in some cases where you might have um, uh, utilities or after a hurricane or something where this may be necessary and there, you know, some exemptions as far as getting broken branches off of cars or houses and or utility lines. So, but as a practice, um, uh, it, it's prohibited and it's not good for the tree. Um, and so don't do it. All right, <laughs> I mean, if a copper nail driven into a tree trunk will kill it. Well, you know, I suppose eventually um, something will kill it, and whether it's associated with a copper nail or not, couldn't tell you. Um, but if you had a tree, let's say you had a Brazilian pepper tree and you wanted to get rid of it, um, once you've cut that and have a stump left, uh, a nail of any type is not going to do anything. So if you're going to, um, uh, you know, control that and get rid of it totally because a, uh, a Brazilian pepper that's been cut like this is going to re-sprout and probably be even more vigorous than it was before. So what do we do? Once you've, you know, cut it, you want to immediately apply the herbicide as a stump cut application um, to the tissue. And so you can see uh, the cambium layer is the living layer. And so that's the most important. There's a lot of non-living uh, uh, tissue in the trunk, but the that cambium or thin layer just under the bark there is where it will pick up the herbicide and translocate it through the rest of the remains of the tree into the roots and, and kill it. Um, 
and that would be a you know a systemic non-selective type herbicide but nails you know i don't think there's any proof <laughs> that that works all right this is an easy one um, <laughs> Uh, prune hedges so that the top is whiter than the bottom. Well, if you look around the landscapes around here, you'll see that almost all hedges are upside down. They should actually have a narrow top and a wide base. And unfortunately, I don't know what it is that people just start doing it so it has a wide top and narrow base, but the consequences of that are you will get leggy growth, you will have um, uh, very unkept look to it. While if you have a more of a trapezoid shape to the hedge, a narrow top and a wide base, sun gets to all areas quite nicely and you will actually end up with um, a much nicer looking hedge. And of course that's with a hedge that's in a uh, formal setting, you know, informal, um, still you wanna do it that same way, but look around at the hedges in our area and see if most of them don't have a wide top and very leggy um, open uh, bases that really don't function ornamentally anymore. Okay, myth, mulch encourages termites and can be a stepping stone to your house. Well, you know, this is, has some um, truth to it. Um, I will say that we try to recommend that you keep mulch away from a house foundation. Um, uh, in that, it can actually, say that you had a termaticide barrier all the way around on the foundation. And so what it did, what it does is it, it repels or blocks or it has a toxic barrier so that termites uh, may carry it back to the nest and eliminate them. But if you put mulch over the top of that, it almost acts as a bridge to when they can get to um, the foundation, make a mud tube in the case of uh, subterranean termites and then work up to a, a source of wood. Um, we'd recommend, you know, a, a, a bit of a open area around up against the foundation. Um, lava rock is a good thing and um, just not uh, organic mulch. Uh, they did some tests um, with uh, mulch to see what uh, termites liked or didn't, did not like. And of course, you know, some of these are more favorable. They're all cellulose and, you know, termites need that. Um, they found that melaleuca was the least uh, tasty to the termites, but, um, uh, best management practice, keep organic mulch away from foundations. If you needed something there, keep, uh, you could use lava rock instead as a barrier. And it's gonna be probably 18 inches out. Try to keep shrubs too away from the foundation. Comp you know, make sure you've got plenty of room for them to grow. And so they don't become a, um, a, a moist area, a place where, and termites need moisture too. Um, so uh, bottom line, keep the mulch away from the house and that will help a lot. To keep that area drier, termites just can't take dryness. And it's also an area that you can observe, um, see if there is any termite activity and also for service areas if things had to be retreated. Okay, um, myth, rubber mulch is touted as a permanent mulch option. Um, rubber mulch is environmentally friendly since it's made of recycled tires and lasts a long time. Well, it's, it's I guess, you know, relatively speaking, permanent. Um, but over time, it's, it, it's probably gonna uh, break down to some degree. Um, different articles are talking about possible chemicals and such that might leach into the soil. Um, you know, it has its place where um, it, it could be used, but um, ag again, research is looking to say, well, maybe this is not uh, the best type of mulch to be using. Um, and in that, it doesn't necessarily um, add to the soil. You will find, though, of course, that um, there are places that um, where you could use it. And um, so 
keep that in mind. Again, we're really recommending more organic type mulches. All right, myths. Make sure to remove grass clippings from the lawn as they contribute to thatch. Um, that's false. Reality, grass clippings do not contribute to thatch and in fact will recycle nutrients back into the lawn. Now thatch is by definition a layer of roots and shoots. And uh, if you slice down into your turf, you can actually see it and measure it. Generally an uh, inch or less, not a big problem. An inch or more, it can become an impenetrable layer where you will um, see the roots are growing up into it. They're actually not even getting to the soil hardly. Uh, it may be harboring chinch bugs and diseases. They may feel spongy. And, and really the contributing factor to that is going to be um, too much water and too much nitrogen. So what do you do if you had an issue like this? And St. Augustine grass would be an example of one that would have this problem. You can verticut it uh, where you have uh, blades that slice down into the turf. They break that impenetrable barrier and that allows uh, that material to decay. Um, and uh, it allows the, the plants to reestablish the roots back into the soil. It's best to do it during the growing season. And um, uh, again, be careful with your watering and nitrogen because again, that will contribute to it. Grass clippings though don't, and they can actually, uh, grass clippings can contribute back to some nutrients getting recycled um, into the lawn. So that's, that's a good thing. All right, you can apply no fertilizer to lawns from June 1st to September 30th. Well, that's sort of true and sort of false. You can't um, use nitrogen or phosphorus June 1st to September 30th. That's our restricted season. And uh, so you cannot put that in. However, there is a, a fertilizer mix called the summer blend and there's different ones, but something like a 0024. Um, that's got potassium, which is very important for uh, plants and turf in general, uh, in that it um, helps them to uh, tolerate stress better, uh, drought and cold and, and other things, plus the sturdy roots. But the summer blend also has magnesium, sulfur, iron, and manganese. So they have a lot of other things. So, you know, as part of the ordinance, no nitrogen and phosphorus. June 1st, September 30th, but you can put these other um, nutrients down to the benefit of the plant. Centipede grass grows well in Southwest Florida. Well, that's an interesting um, note. Um, often you can go into garden centers and find centipede grass seed for sale, but it's really not, uh, does not do well for our area. It's really a more of a North Florida up into Georgia type grass. Um, it likes acidic uh, soils and we have very alkaline soils. It's very low growing and it has a bit of a, a yellowish green color, but that's natural and it doesn't really need a lot of nutrients. But never say never because there is a cultivar that's adapted to our area called hammock and you can get it only as a sod. Um, uh, it's a very different looking grass, very low growing. So it you know, may not appeal to you even, but Technically, there is a cultivar of centipede grass that we could grow here in Southwest Florida. All right, myth, moles eat plant bulbs and roots. Um, moles being insectivores are, are not gonna really be bothering with um, bulbs and roots. Now they may go and dig around areas like that looking for invertebrates to eat, but um, and, and that could cause roots to dry out, but they're not going after those. Uh, they're insectivores and their favorite food is, is earthworms. Um, they may eat other things like uh, grubs and whatever else they find in the soil that's um, an invertebrate uh, of some type. And they eat a lot in a day just to maintain their energy needs. Um, so <laughs> what do we recommend? Well, one is to tolerance. You can tolerate moles because they're actually um, um, aerating the soil. Um, and all, although the surface tunnels may be unsightly, uh, I find that, you know, 
well, they're going to be attracted to irrigated areas because moisture also attracts their food source. And so that's where they're going to be. As the, the rainy season comes back, they tend to disperse and are less of a problem. They have deep tunnels and shallow tunnels. And we don't really recommend treating for uh, grubs um, to get rid of moles. We would, uh, because there may not be enough mole uh, grubs to warrant a treatment. And since they're mostly eating earthworms, you know, what's the sense of that? And if you're going to control for grubs, we'd recommend you monitor for that test first before you take that action. Um, so, you know, overall, if you wanted to get rid of moles, we'd recommend mole traps. If you find one of their surface tunnels, you can press down on it. And if it pops back up in 24 hours, it's probably a good place to to set one of these mole traps, making sure that kids and pets don't, wildlife don't get into it, cover it with a box. Um, but generally, you know, I would say most of us can tolerate moles. There is, all, there is also a um, mole repellent, but it's very short term. It has a castor oil ingredient in it. And I think there's even um, um, some toxins that uh, are used as well. Um, but I don't, a lot of times, I just don't think it's necessary in our area. Okay, another one talking about white grubs here, an armadillo's favorite food is white grubs. Um, they did tests, I think it was like 40 different ingredients um, from, you know, grubs to vanilla wafers, and they found that armadillos prefer earthworms and crickets. Now, will they go after grubs? They certainly will. They're going to be feeding around, looking for food, and again, coming to our irrigated areas because that's where a lot of the invertebrates are going to be hanging out. So what do you do? Um, again, we're not necessarily recommending treating for grubs to keep armadillos out because, again, that's not necessarily their number one food. Um, and there may not be sufficient um, grubs to warrant a treatment. Um, number two, the armadillos will come and go, of course. Um, it's, you can live trap them, um, but you'd have to, uh, probably we're going to recommend get a wildlife nuisance control person to do that. Um, it, it is somewhat difficult to trap them, um, but the professionals will know how to do that. And, uh, um, but keep in mind, as soon as you get rid of one, it's likely another one will take its place. But I would not be trying to treat for that. And again, I find that as the rainy season uh, occurs, it's moist everywhere. There's food more often found everywhere, and they will tend to disperse. All right, myth. Epsom salts is a good all-around fertilizer for palms. Well, Epsom salts is just one nutrient. It's magnesium sulfate. And of course, it's a necessary nutrient for um, palms. And you can see that Canary Island date palm in the picture has a magnesium deficiency. The yellowing outer frondlets with the green, dark green um, midrib is a sign. Uh, you can see it from the base there. It's beginning to work its way up. Well, the magnesium sulfate would be uh, the corrective material to apply, and it will take some time for new fronds not to show that deficiency as they age out, um, but the older fronds will not uh, change color. They're always going to have that deficiency there. So what do you recommend? Well, in this case, you could do a treatment with Epsom, with the magnesium sulfate, but pops need a well-balanced diet, just like we do. And so we'd recommend um, a slow-release granular um, 8 2 12 4, or an 8-0-12-4, if you can find it, uh, that has no uh, phosphorus in it. We don't, don't really need it. And apply it in November, February, and May as per label instructions. And again, this is a granular material. You would apply it away from um, the trunk, broadcast it under the canopy to the drip line and out from there um, because the feeder roots are probably within a couple inches and then water it in with about a quarter inch of water and you should be good to go. Now in August, because we are in the restricted season then, use a 00166, um, again, as label directions, and that has no nitrogen or phosphorus, but that's a complete um, uh, meal for the uh, palms. Look around to try to find this. It's not 
the easiest material to find. And there's a good couple of publications that explain better what you should be looking for on our um, publication website, EDIS, E as in Ed, D as in Dog, I as in Ice, and S as in Sam. Just put um, POM in the search engine and then you'll find um, uh, information about that. Um, but you'll find that uh, as our soils are very deficient in, in nutrients, this will really help and support palm growth in our area. All right, mothballs can control the mouse problems um, as well as repel snakes and other wildlife. Well, that is definitely an old myth. Um, and mothballs um, are a pesticide and they are not labeled for that use. Um, they're, they're intended to kill closed moths and their eggs um, in things like garment bags, storage closets, and airtight containers. But uh, not only do they not work as repellents for wildlife such as that, um, but you might end up, you know, with kids picking them up or wildlife, and it's nothing you want to be getting into either. So mothballs are not a suggested, and it actually would be illegal to use mothballs impro improperly. Uh, because they are a label pesticide and they're for the control of uh, clothes moths. So uh, don't use mothballs to try to take care of those wildlife problems. All right, int myth, intercropping marigolds with uh, other crops eradicates plant parasite parasitic nematodes. Well, um, you know, they did some studies on this, um, but there's always been the thought that marigolds and uh, the materials they may secrete in their roots or in their tissue could help um, uh, eradicate nematodes. And it's, you know, it says here, marigolds can suppress 14 genera of plant parasitic nematodes um, uh, with lesion nematodes and root knot nematodes, uh, root knot nematodes being very common. Um, intercropping marigold with other crops to reduce plant parasite nematodes does not appear to be very effective though. And there was a EDIS publication on this. I don't know if it's still up or not, but they did some studies and it was very specific um, where you had to grow this big giant solid patch of marigolds and then till it in. And then, you know, so the, the intercropping um, didn't work as well. Um, as they thought. And um, I would say that it's nice to have flowers with vegetables and crops and such, but I would not depend on it to eradicate um, uh, to any great degree um, any of these nematodes uh, to a degree that is going to be helpful to us. Nematodes uh, are everywhere. They're microscopic worms that get into the roots of plants and sometimes in the foliage. Um, often, as far as garden, vegetable gardens, incorporation of compost is, is a good way to go because it tends to, um, or they believe it has organisms that may help suppress nematodes. So. Uh, anytime you can in your vegetable garden add compost, it's a good thing. And it, it may, and I've experienced that, I've had reduced nematode problems when I've used it. Okay, uh, myth, lufus gourds are only good for making sponges. Well, you know, that would be the thing that we're most uh, often uh, exposed to, uh, lufus sponges and, and their products. But before they become into a sponge, they can actually be used like a vegetable, sort of like a zucchini. Uh, I've tasted them. They're pretty good. And there are some varieties that, um, you know, are selected for that purpose. They certainly can make a sponge afterwards because, the you know, the sponges are the mature um, fruit or gourd in this case. So when you're using them as a vegetable, you got to, you know, keep up on it because they can go from a, a tender vegetable to a fibrous thing very quickly. But it is a, it's a good vegetable and uh, uh, lufa sponges are very uh, vigorous plants. All right, here's one. Wood ashes make great nutrients for our Florida soils. Well, that's definitely a, a no-no. And here's a... Um, a pH range. And so it goes from zero to 14, seven is neutral in the middle. And um, anything less than seven is acidic. Anything more than seven is alkaline. 
most plants like it between you know six and seven although there are a lot of acid loving plants that prefer it maybe down to five or so like blueberries and exora now you put wood ashes down um, and that is going to increase the alkalinity uh, very high <laughs> and so you maybe you have a seven and and you put wood ashes down it, i've seen it where it'll go up into 11 as far as a ph level and it, 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 in all intensive terms it's almost sterilizes the soil um, so we don't recommend the use of wood ashes um, in soils because you can never properly distribute them um, properly so that it doesn't affect the pH. Our, our soils in our residential areas are very alkaline. They're about 7.6 to 7.8. Uh, but a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of our plants are acid loving. Hibiscus, gardenia, uh, exora, uh, blueberries, etc. prefer the, the more acidic conditions. And um, it, if they are growing, say an exora in a 7.8 or higher pH, they won't do so well. They'll yellow because they will have nutrients they can't tap into. When nutrients, when the pH level gets too high, some nutrients like uh, iron, for example, uh, become unavailable or less available. And that's when you get yellowing of leaves. So it's very important that we have um, um, a good grasp of our soil pH um, a lot of the times, um, well, for landscapes, it's very difficult to, uh, to get the pH lowered. You can use pelleted elemental sulfur, but it's, it's almost futile because you may get it down um, into the slightly acidic range, but it will neutralize back to where it was eventually. So, um, and, and, and in cases where uh, you're growing something like blueberries, well, they actually plant them in pine bark. Um, and, you know, that can be done, but you, when you're growing those plants specifically, you got to keep really up on uh, monitoring the pH um, because the, the plants won't do well otherwise. But wood ashes, not good. Bristle top in palms is only caused by lack of manganese. Well, this is interesting. Bristle top, you'll see, in a, unfortunately, in a lot of palms. And um, it's a it's a lack of a, a manganese. It's in the newest uh, foliage, and it tends to make the uh, fronds frizzy and distorted and browned. Um, so it can be an actual lack of manganese, which you can supply, of course, with the proper palm fertilizer. But they found that uh, composted sewage sludge and manure can actually cause a or induce an artificial lack of manganese and cause the same condition. So be careful about using those materials around palms. You know, they're fine otherwise, but um, uh, would not be using those as fertilizers or soil amendments around palms because they can uh, induce an artificial manganese deficiency. Okay, myth, hurricane cut palms are more hurricane resistant. Uh, false, they're not. Uh, not only are they going to um, stress the palm because the palm relies on the fronds to make food and store food. And people have sort of strange ideas what they want a palm to look like. And sometimes they just go overboard. So the hurricane cuts are out. We don't recommend the 10 and two as they call it either. Um, you want to retain all the palm fronds as, as many as possible. You know, the palm frond, as it ages out, will go from green to yellow to brown and then should be removed. If you needed to take a few green ones off, just if you could imagine a horizontal line at the base of the fronds, just take um, whatever is below that horizontal line off, leave everything above in place. Um, I, I, again, you see this all the time and it may not hurt, kill the palm outright. Um, but they did studies and found, number one, they're not more hurricane resistant. They're more hurricane prone. Number two, they're taking away their ability to make and store food. And the stress may actually call in 
organisms like um, palmetto beetles, which love to go after stress palms and they overwhelm them and kill them. So you got to be very careful about this and um, don't go overboard with it. Okay, myth white scaly materials on the front uh, new palm fronds is often scale infestation or a fungal infection, which needs treatment. Now you got to look closely here. And again, scale insects can look like this, but this is something that's called scurf. And it's a white scaly material on new palm fronds of certain palms. So here's a pygmy date palm that has that. There's a few others that have it. There's even some that will have a pinkish or blackish scurf, but it's harmless. It just weathers off in time and nothing needs to be done. But you know, that's why it's sometimes helpful to have a little hand lens to see closer what's going on. But we get this um, uh, concern quite often. And in this case, it's called scurf and it's just part of the plant and harmless. Right, my uh, myth, my palm's roots are coming out of the ground and it probably was not planted deep enough. Now, why there are cases when this can occur, um, what you're seeing in these pictures is sort of a, a palm that's matured. And um, the we'll go with the one on the right there. Those are uh, roots that are now developing all the way up the side of the trunk for a couple feet up. And there, are, there is a root initiation zone underneath, and that's where the roots develop. Now, as some palms grow and get mature, sometimes that root initiation zone begins to get higher up on the trunk at the base, and you'll start seeing that. Well, the roots don't go anywhere because they hit air and they sort of root prune naturally. Um, the same thing, the one on the left, you'll see um, some palm bases will flare off, almost looks like they're ripping a little bit there as that root mass expands. Now, of course, um, those roots, there's plenty of roots, they're already growing. In some cases, there are situations where the, the palm was planted too high and there isn't a good anchorage. So you have to play by ear a little bit. But in these two cases, it's um, what they call normal abnormality. It may look um, alarming, but it, it, it's good enough. And the palm is uh, uh, anchored well. And these are just, again, extra roots coming out uh, perfectly normal. All right, we talked about palm stress and such. It says, um, uh, myth, only stress palms attract palmetto weevils. Well, palmetto weevil is a native insect. It's really good size. I mean, they can be inch and a half or so, orange and black in color. Um, and they will tend to go, or they, they used to tend to go after stress palms. So say you had a canary island date palm and you over pruned it. Uh, that's gonna be a stress palm just waiting for it. And those stress palms give off a chemical scent and the, the palmetto beetles pick it up there. They can detect it, they come in, they send off their own pheromones to attract others. They lay eggs in the tree and the grubs, which are a good two and a half, three inches, bore into the heart of the palm and eventually kill it. Well, um, they started seeing though that apparently healthy Bismarck palms and sometimes even apparently healthy Canary Island date palms were being attacked by palmetto weevil. So, um, so that sort of changed the game a little bit where uh, we did not see any stress necessarily. Maybe there was unseen stress going on. And so what do people do about this? Well, you know, initially, if, if a palm is healthy, it's, it's pretty much on its own. It's going to be okay. Um, in some high value showcase palms like Bismarck's, people have, have sometimes used some systemic insecticide as a protectant. There's no guarantee, of course, of that. Um, but uh, in some cases with very showcase palm specimens, it may be warranted. Otherwise, the bottom line is don't over prune, keep the palms properly fed and unstressed. But, you know, always be on the lookout. Myth, only palms in poor health get Ganoderma butt rot. Well, Ganoderma butt rot is a common fungal disease that only affects palms, it affects all palms. And what it does... Uh, they believe is it crosses the roots, gets into the base 
of the trunk and then begins to work inside up to about five foot um, from the soil level. It dissolves the structure of the uh, palm interior and will cause uh, wilting and discoloration. But one of the key things is this conch. So it's really a, a mushroom or the flower of the fungus coming out. And um, they found it, it a healthy and unhealthy palms alike can get it. There's no rhyme or reason why that is, um, why they're getting it. The spores though, uh, which are released by the conch will blow in the wind and the rain and can move about. So, you know, once you see a conch, it's a sign that it is infected and will eventually have to come down because the structure integrity of the trunk will be damaged and it will possibly be a blowover. But in the meantime, to collect and remove those conchs, put them in a Ziploc bag and dispose in the trash, will at least help reduce the amount of spores flowing around. So it's sort of like being a good neighbor. Um, all palms can get it. I would say canary on, canary on date palms get it often as well as queen palms, but I've seen it on foxtails and areca palms. Now on, on areca palms, which are clumping palms and clumping palms in general, you don't have to remove the whole palm. Um, you can manage each individual trunk um, and work it that away. But if it's a single stem palm, you have to take it out and you can't put another palm in its place because the organism seems to hang out indefinitely and can reinfect that um, uh, plant. And you, you can do take the soil out and fumigate and all this and that, but you don't know, maybe the new palm you've moved in already has it. So put something unrelated to palms, any woody plant um, will be fine and won't get it. Okay, Africanized honeybees typically do not attack unless provoked. Well, um, you know, we have Africanized honeybees in our area, and they're often, of course, a percentage. I remember they sent away a, uh, a set years ago when there was an attack, and it was like 29% uh, Africanized. And that was through DNA and looking at the wing pattern and such. But at a glance, they look like regular honeybees. But they have some behaviors where they'll like to go in places that European honeybees don't tend to go like they like to go into water utility boxes um, irrigation boxes uh, other types of small uh, nooks and crannies um, abandoned grills uh, all uh, birdhouses etc now um, they tend to get more agitated than the european and they'll chase you farther up the 300 yards if an attack occurs Sometimes, though, it's, it's, they're triggered by uh, machinery like tractors or chainsaw or a, uh, a vibration or something that causes that to occur. And they're not more, uh, you know, they only have one sting per bee, and they're no different than that as far as them and Europeans, but more of them will come after you. So um, versus, you know, going in and reaching in, not recommended to disturb them, which will certainly cause an attack, some other things that you wouldn't even think of may provoke an attack. And since they are hazard, um, you know, they are nowadays commercial people are um, either eradicating them or removing them and then requeening them with the European until eventually the whole hive becomes European. But you want to be taking care of this because it it, if an attack occurs, it could get out of hand and you don't want to be liable for that. As far as surrounding neighbors, never try to use aerosol type sprays to, to kill them because it causes a bigger attack. Let the professionals deal with it because they have the material and the equipment to deal with it. Myth, uh, concentrating fertilizer in whole spikes or bands around the trunks of palms is an effective uh, more effective, in fact, effective than spreading fertilizer for palms. Well, that's not true. We don't really recommend um, spikes or putting, you know, making holes uh, or even bands. We want to um, actually spread fertilizer out evenly away from the trunk, um, underneath the, uh, uh, the canopy of the tree, uh, the drip line and beyond. I mean, some of the roots go out quite a distance 
and um, they're generally up a couple inches water, uh, quarter inch of water, and that will activate the fertilizer and get it down underground to take care of it. Um, but to use this type of um, method or even injecting fertilizer, it's, it's, there's a lot of movement of that. And so we'd recommend, again, just using the, reg the granular fertilizer we talked about earlier um, and not to have thick, heavy bands, have it the granules spread out evenly and it will do a much better job of, of feeding and distributing the nutrients properly. All right, the citru citrosa plant repels mosquitoes. Now you'll see these uh, mosquito plants, um, they have quite a scent to them, the citronella oil that comes off it. Says it's been widely used as a mosquito repellent. Um, the undisturbed plant itself does not release these oils and is not effect as a, effective as a repellent. So, although I guess the concentrated oils can uh, be used, you know, commercially, the plant itself that unless it's been rubbed and, and moved about and manipulated, it's not going to release these oils, and so you wouldn't have that um, repellent activity. Okay, bats and owls and other birds can control mosquitoes. Well, um, although they may, the diet may include some mosquitoes, um, and let's concentrate on bats mostly here, that, um, you know, bats may eat mosquitoes, but they tend to like to eat larger, higher calorie insects like moths and such there. Um, and because the, it may take a long time to eat all those little mosquitoes to make a, a dent in their uh, nutritional needs every day. So there may be some, but they're, they're, they're not as big a mosquito eaters, I think, as they thought originally, um, uh, where they're going after, again, larger, higher calorie targets like uh, moths. All right, myth, you need a special compost starter to get a compost pile working. Um, you'll see a lot of these materials um, for sale. And although they may contain things that will start it, generally um, just a shovel full or two of soil has got everything you need to get um, a composting action going. It's got the bacteria and fungi. Uh, you know, in general, you see this picture here. Uh, you have to have a three foot by three foot by three foot size bin. Um, the material is uh, 30 parts carbon or brown stuff to every part nitrogen or green stuff. And you've mixed that evenly. You got it wet as a wrung out, wrung out sponge. And by adding some uh, just plain old soil, um, it will actually uh, start the process, release enough bacteria and fungi to get the process going. So um, although you can buy compost starter, you really can just use uh, your own soil to get it going. All right, myth, all Mexican petunias are invasive and not recommended. Well, this is a ticklish one. You know, the regular um, Mexican petunias have been a bread and butter item for years uh, in landscapes because they're very beautiful, but they're also very invasive. Uh, <clears throat> not only the, the plant parts, but the seeds will pop and go all over the place. So they are a problem as an invasive plant. They have done some work though. And um, there's a couple varieties that are better. Doesn't mean though that they can't continue to spread with plant parts or as the clump gets bigger, but they are sterile. So they don't have the seed issue. So some of the cultivars, Mayan purple, Mayan white, Mayan pink, there's also purple showers. Um, these are improved. Um, so if you were to get this uh, plant, which is readily available everywhere, uh, you want to try to look for these um, cultivars over the others. Um, but just like a lot of these plants, you know, be careful to keep them in um, captivity, I guess. Do not be uh, throwing pieces out in places where they can take root other, other places. So, you know, as a responsibility in a place like Florida where invasive plants are numerous, um, this would be an important um, thing to keep in mind. Okay, <laughs> there are four poisonous snakes in Southwest Florida. 
Now, I heard this from a specialist once, and I said, oh, what's, what's, what's he talking about? Uh, but actually, there are no poisonous snakes in southwest Florida. They're all edible, but there are four venomous snakes in southwest Florida. So um, uh, upper left, you get the pygmy rattler. Um, upper right, the eastern diamondback. Um, lower left, the coral snake. And uh, lower right, the um, cottonmouth. Um, you know, these are all here. I would say I've seen cottonmouths more than any. Um, <clears throat> I've seen uh, maybe one or two coral snakes, uh, one or two diamondbacks, and I don't think I've seen any live um, uh, pygmy rattlers. But, you know, these are all things to be aware of, uh, especially the, the eastern diamondback can, can put you in a serious condition. So, you know, they're here. You just want to make sure you're aware of your surroundings and to um, uh, uh, be able to identify and see these and, and avoid them. Okay, myth. There are native populations of brown recluse spiders in Florida. Well, it's really a myth. And a lot of people claim to have been bitten by brown recluse. But other than the extreme... Uh, tip of it's Escambia County, there's really no native populations here. They may come in accidentally, and that's often how the case where they'll come in from other southern states in containers, uh, rugs, uh, whatever, uh, but they don't seem to be able to, uh, to uh, populate our area. Maybe it's just the climate. They're not very big spiders. Uh, they have six eyes instead of eight, which is a different thing from other spiders. And they have a little tiny fiddle back on their, uh, the back of the, their uh, cephalothorax. Um, so there are other things that may cause brown recluse spider-like um, bites or uh, lesions. Uh, Mercer is one where there'd be a, an infection. Um, some people may also be a bit by other things that have the same type of reaction. And again, the brown recluse is noted for its bite then, then causes a, a necrotic spot that often has to be removed because it just doesn't heal. So it's a very serious thing, but it's, it's more common uh, north and west of us. But Florida typically does not have um, brown recluse. Um, and uh, people that get certain um, manifestations that look like a brown recluse bite may be, uh, again, an infection or a bite from some other uh, spider that they may be uh, 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 a reaction, some kind of reaction or allergy to. Um, so, uh, you know, be careful. And, uh, you know, all spiders can bite and have venom, but, you know, most of them are not medically significant. And that's all, folks. You know, uh, these are just some of the myths. And, of course, some of these have some bits of truth in them. Um, but, uh, you know, just keep in mind when people say different things to, to look a little closer. And I hope you've enjoyed this uh, program. And uh, uh, make sure to join us for uh, the next Landscape Gardening Series. Thank you.